All right. Good morning, everybody. Again, thank you for joining us this morning for another installment of the Prestige series of COVID-19 webinars. My name is Jason Flynn, and I am the Director of Human Resources and Client Services for Prestige Employee Administrators. Along with me again this morning is Andrew Lubash, and it's certainly nice to have him again. As we've mentioned in past webinars, Andy has been involved with NAPIO for quite some time um, and is currently the chairperson. Andrew is also the principal at Prestige, so again, it's nice to have his insight here on the call this morning. We'd also like to welcome back Seth Peretta. Seth is uh, a principal at the law group, at the Groom Law Group, and uh, again, it's always nice to have his insight. He started off on the uh, PPP loan forgiveness application program last week, was able to provide some really nice insight to really start kicking off that process as uh, that's coming down the wire here for a lot of people on this call and a lot of organizations. So again, it is really nice to have uh, Seth spend some time with us this morning. As for today's agenda, Andrew and Seth will be kicking things off this morning with some legal updates. Uh, the focus today will revolve mostly around the loan forgiveness details as we started last week. Seth will specifically be getting into some legislative developments as well as some further guidance around the Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiveness application. Now, as a reminder, all participants will be muted throughout the webinar. However, if you do have a question, I urge you to use the Q&A feature within the webinar and direct the question to the panelists. Of course, we're going to do everything we can to answer all of the incoming questions. If there are any outstanding that um, do go unanswered towards the end of the webinar, we will reach out to you to get that answer to you. And a copy of the presentation will be available on the COVID or within the COVID Resource Center of the Prestige website following the webinar. At this point, what I'd like to do is to introduce Andy Lubash, who will take it from here. Good morning, everybody. And again, thank you for attending the continuous uh, Wednesday webinars regarding uh, the corona or coronavirus uh, pandemic. I know this has been a tough time for everybody um, all over the map, nothing like we've ever experienced. But again, I just want to reiterate, we are here to guide you on a myriad of different things. Um, again, I've worked with Seth Peretta now for, oh, it's got to be at least 10 years um, with my involvement in NAPIO, first when I was chairman of State Government Affairs and now as chairman of NAPIO. Um, Seth brings materials and just has a way of answering questions and dispensing knowledge like no one else that I have uh, ever experienced. And again, anyone that was on last week's webinar can understand that. So now we're going to move into the second phase of how to complete the PPP um, forgiveness. Also, again, a lot's happening for everybody. I mean, today, again, in Nassau County and Suffolk County, where our offices are located, um, we finally have gotten phase one reopening. So, again, in addition to PPP uh, loan forgiveness, we're also going to be having to deal with the coming weeks of how to get everybody back to work, um, you know, what reopening is going to look like, um, what employers um, can and can't do, and different policies and procedures that um, – are available to you. And again, on our website, you'll see that we did start a checklist. And then again, other clients that are on here right now are in different states and different locales. Um, again, you range from fully open to um, still uh, shelter in place. So again, um, we're here to address all of the different uh, situations throughout the country. Everything is different. Um, hopefully, again, we are moving forward. Uh, Starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, again, as I mentioned in the past webinars, again, I am available, and most of you, a lot of you have taken me up on that um, to get a hold of me. Again, my direct extension is 917, that will bypass our switchboard, 258-0223. Um, my cell is 516-680-5021. And my email address is alubash, A-L-U-B-A-S-H, at prestigepeo.com. Okay, um, I realize everybody's busy, so I'm not going to continue to ramble on, because otherwise they're going to mute me, um, and then everyone will applaud. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Seth Peretta. Seth, it's yours. Yes. Thank you, Andy, for the incredibly kind uh, opening. Uh, really happy to be here today. 
Um, in terms of today's discussion, uh, what we're going to talk about, and this is uh, right here on this slide, very quick update on some potential legislative developments regarding the PPP program. Um, as many of you may know, some of the guidance that has come out of Treasury related to the PPP program uh, is not necessarily in line with perhaps what Congress was thinking when it passed the actual piece of legislation. Um, so to provide further relief to small business, both the House and the um, Senate have proposed uh, legislation that would liberalize various aspects of the rules. So, you know, it's something to keep in mind here as we walk through today's uh, uh, discussion is that this is still a somewhat dynamic uh, world in which we are operating. And as we'll talk about uh, in the next bullet here, when to apply for forgiveness, my general counsel to, to folks is, is do not rush. There is no need to race for the money um, and in part because of the potential legislation that might liberalize these rules, as well as we're expecting, you know, further guidance to come out. Um, you may be better off waiting uh, to apply for forgiveness uh, rather than racing in. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the legislation. And then really the rest of today is, is we're going to start part one of a three part series. that's going to walk you through how to actually complete the application. And we're going to be doing it using a case study. Um, the part one, this is the one, this is the part of the series where it's probably going to take us the longest and uh, it's the most sort of uh, rigorous in terms of having to look at data, calculate data, manipulate data in order to complete that Schedule A worksheet. So in part one, we're, which is today, we're going to focus on the Schedule A worksheet. Next week, part two is then doing the Schedule A, and then the third week we'll be actually completing the loan forgiveness application itself. Um, so we're hoping that over the course of the next three weeks, we'll take you from point A to point Z and give you information you're going to need to be able to actually complete the application yourself. Moving to the next slide here, um, this is uh, the summary of the House legislation that was proposed. Um, this is a piece of legislation that we are expecting may be voted on by the House as early as by the end of this week. Not entirely clear, but certainly that is what uh, the Democrats have been pushing for. Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, really wants to move this and move it quickly. Um, you'll see here there's a couple big aspects of this legislation that will be important as you think about when to apply for forgiveness. Because you'll see here it eliminates the requirement that Treasury uh, created, which is that 75% of the forgivable amount be based on eligible payroll costs. That 75% requirement, which we're going to talk about um, throughout this sort of presentation over the next several weeks, is a concept that was created by Treasury. It is presumably based on the idea that Congress intended for, you know, a material portion of the loan amount to be used for uh, basically payroll for, for it's called the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, that having been said, I think Congress was surprised by the imposition of that 75% requirement and the House bill would eliminate it. The House bill also would, rather than only giving you eight weeks to incur covered expenses, um, it would give you 24 weeks. Um, and lastly, it would allow, well, two other things. It would basically allow employers to utilize the deferral of uh, payroll taxes that is otherwise available regardless of whether a loan is forgiven. And it would provide basically a way to avoid the FTE reduction factor, which is one of the two ways your forgiveness amount can be reduced if you're basically able to rehire certain employees on or before the end of this year, the current uh, rules give you basically until June 30th. This would give you until the end of 2020. The Senate bill, which is reflected on the next slide, uh, is similar, but not identical. So if we look at the next slide here, we will see that it does many of the same things. Um, it extends the deadline to apply for a PPP loan until 2020. That's a little bit different. In terms of extending the covered period, rather than 24 weeks, it would go from eight to 16 weeks here. 
Um, the one interesting thing in the Senate bill that's not in the House bill, uh, at least you know, to, to note here, is that borrowers could use the loan funds to purchase PPE for employees and to pay for adaptive investments needed to sort of reopen your business. Um, and it does clarify that the current lender hold harmless provision relates to all Treasury guidance regarding the PPP loans, intending to take some of the pressure off of the lenders which the thought is it would then trickle down and take some of the pressure off of the borrowers. But um, we don't expect Senate to vote on this piece of legislation until sometime in June. So I think realistically, the earliest we'll see any, um, any piece of law being potentially signed into law by President Trump would be mid to late June. Um, again, thinking about the reality here of when to apply for forgiveness, probably to your benefit to wait to see uh, what Congress does before racing in to get your amounts forgiven. All right, moving on to the next slide. When to apply. As I explained on last week's call, there is no need to race to submit your application for forgiveness. Unlike with the initial loan application where you were worried about the money running out, we do not need to worry about that here. Given the complexity of the application, uh, you really need to be careful and deliberate. And there are some opportunities to potentially maximize your forgiveness by thinking carefully about whether to use this period or that period, um, et cetera. There are three additional reasons why not to rush. If you have had a headcount reduction, and this is relative to a past historical reference period, they may or there may be value in waiting until, you know, after June 30, 2020, or at least until you can restore your, your headcount to pre pandemic levels. And as I mentioned, you know, some of the legislation might even give you until the end of 2020 to uh, bring those uh, headcount levels back uh, and still get your amounts fully forgiven. The future legislation may also liberalize other aspects, such as eliminating the 75% threshold on forgivable amounts coming from payroll. And then as we'll talk about today, what happened on Friday of last week is, you know, two weeks ago uh, on that, so two Fridays ago, we got the loan application and the instructions, but we didn't have the actual regulations. On Friday night, uh, right before the holiday, they issued a series of regulations to provide clarity and information on how to apply for forgiveness and what amounts are forgivable. There were some very helpful answers in there. All in all, there was a lot that was not answered. And so we are expecting that over the next several weeks, we will see further guidance from the regulators uh, in terms of how to apply for forgiveness. This may be another reason to delay racing in for forgiveness because as the weeks go on, we're expecting to have further clarity on how Treasury and SBA um, uh, will be expecting the lenders to perform the forgiveness analysis. All right, moving on to the next slide here. So as we talked about, we're not gonna walk through this again, but there are four parts to the loan application. And the part that we are focusing on first here is, is that number three document the Schedule A worksheet. Until you complete the Schedule A worksheet, you can't complete the Schedule A or the application form itself. So what we're focusing on here today is number three, the Schedule A worksheet, which must be retained for six years. You're actually not gonna be submitting the worksheet uh, to the to, uh, Treasury SBA or to the lender, but it will be something you'll need to retain in case of audit or enforcement. All right, moving to the next slide here. As I mentioned, you can't do the Schedule A until you do the worksheet. So if you're thinking you're going to jump into the Schedule A, you have a lot of upfront work that still needs to be done. And we're going to walk through that today. All right, on our next slide here. So here is our case study. We are going to use a hypothetical company to walk through the rules and how they work and how you apply, how you complete that Schedule A worksheet. Our company, we were not very creative with that name, it's Acmeco. That company has one owner employee, Burks in stock. Uh, 
Uh, and the employee roster has some pretty creative names here. Paul P. Phillips, uh, who likes to monogram his shirts with PPP. Uh, coronavirus, Fauci, Noah Swab, and Serology. Serology, you'll note, was terminated on April 1st, which was prior to their loan disbursement date of April 15th of 2020. And they had a loan amount of $90,000. And this last bullet is really important. They use a biweekly payroll period. All right. So we're going to look at Acme Co. and we're going to then start that Schedule A worksheet. The first step for anyone is not to complete <laughs> Table 1 yet. You'll see there's a big do not enter sign. You cannot even begin to complete schedule, uh, Table 1 on the worksheet until you determine the applicable payroll covered period. For employers that use a payroll period that is uh, monthly or uh, every four weeks, they're gonna be using the default payroll, uh, default payroll covered period, which is the eight week period or the 56 day period that begins on the loan origination date. The default option uh, is the eight week, 56 day period beginning on loan origination date. But if you are an employer that uses payroll frequency that is at least as frequent as two weeks or biweekly, so you pay weekly, you pay semi monthly, you pay every two weeks, um, you will be able to choose the alternative payroll covered period. And what that does is that allows you to use the eight week period that begins on the first day of the first payroll period beginning after the loan origination date. You might wanna run both calculations to see which one results in better numbers for you. But um, at the end of the day, if you're biweekly or more frequent, you can choose the alternative covered period. As we'll talk about under the, under the cash compensation rule, even though we're talking about a 56 day period, whether you use the default or the alternative, the 56 day period actually will allow you to pick up expenses that were either uh, not only incurred and paid during that 56 day period, but expenses incurred before that 56 day period and paid during that 56 day period can also get picked up, as well as expenses incurred during that 56 day period and paid after, uh, if they meet various rules, can also get picked up. So while we're talking about a 56 day period here, because of what we're calling the incurred or paid rule, um, it's gonna potentially pick up payroll and non-payroll expenses that uh, uh, extend beyond just those 56 days. So it's important to keep that in mind. So using our case study here on the next slide, we're gonna look at Acme Code. And Acme Co., as I mentioned, pays on a weekly, on a biweekly basis. So they look at this and they, are, they decide they're going to use the alternative payroll covered period because their loan originated on April 15th. And because the next payroll period began on April 19th, their eight week period for looking at table one, for looking at eligible payroll costs, et cetera, runs from April 19th through June 13th. That is their 56 day period. Okay, so now we're gonna move on and we're, we're ready to jump into that table one, but wait, there's something else we need to think about. You'll see on that schedule a worksheet, there are two tables, table one and table two. The only employees that get listed in table one are employees who were working during that 56 day period so ours is April 19th through June 13th, who worked at least one hour. But the folks in table one are gonna be those who had less than or equal to $100,000 of annualized cash compensation in 2019, right? Here we're talking 2020, we're thinking 2020 pandemic, we're thinking 2020 56 day period. But for purposes of table one and table two, differentiator is going to be what their annualized cash comp was in 2019. So if they were at or below 100k in 19, they're in table 1. If they're if they're above 100k, they're in table 2. Now, 
you think, okay, finally, I'm ready to get to, you know, listing people. I'm really excited. I'm, I'm ready to go. Sadly, it's shown on the next slide. There's one last thing you need to keep in mind, which is remember under the instructions and under the regulations, owner employees, self-employed individuals and general partners are never listed on tables one or two. They're going to be captured elsewhere on the actual schedule A to the application. So if you have an owner employee, such as Kirk's in stock, she will not be reflected on either table one or table two. But so with that in mind, let's move to a few examples based on ACMECO about how you figure out which employee goes where. All right, let's take Noah Swab. His highest biweekly payroll was $4,615, which results in annualized comp of 120 k in 19. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the instructions, they sort of suggest that the way you figure out annualized comp is not necessarily looking at how much money they made in 19 as reflected on, say, a, a W-2. They sort of suggest you take their highest payroll period and you annualize it. Now, we're hoping we'll get clarifying guidance that suggests this is not required, but for purposes of our examples, we're following the instructions. So his highest biweekly payroll was 4,615. That would put him at 120K of annualized salary. However, as a result of his pandemic, his hours are being reduced by 50% to 20 hours, and he's slated to make about 60K in 2020. I don't really care what he made in 2020 for purposes of figuring out which table he goes in. Because his cash comp was in excess of 100K in 2019, he will be listed on table two. In contrast to Noah, let's look at Cora. Cora's highest bi-weekly payroll was 3,076, or 80K of annualized comp in 2019. She, on the other hand, is on track to make, say, 120K of annual cash comp, perhaps because she's paid on, on commissions. Regardless of her actual or expected 2020 cash comp, because she made less than 100K in 19, she gets listed on table one. You know, one thing we're not entirely clear is how you deal with uh, an annualizing 2019 comp based on a one-time bonus that may have been paid in 2019. Uh, as of right now, it is unclear as to how that is treated. We hope we will receive clarifying guidance in the future on that point. Okay, moving to the next slide. We have two more examples. As I mentioned, we have Burks in stock. We don't care how much money she made in 19 at all. Because she is an owner employee, she should not be listed on tables one or tables two. And now we and then we have serial OG in example D. He was not an employee during the relevant payroll covered period, which as mentioned, ACME ended up using the alternative payroll covered period. So we'd look at that. And he was terminated on April 1, before the start of the alternative payroll covered period. Therefore, he should not be listed on tables one or two. But don't forget about serology. He will come back to be relevant for various calculations throughout uh, the completion of the application. But he does not get listed on tables one or tables two. All right, so now we have our table one, right? Noah Swab's on table two, but we have Paul, Cora, and Fao listed on table one. The first thing you do, step three, is you've got to fill out table one now with the information. And the first thing we do here is we put the employee identifier, which is the last four digits of their social security number. It's not whatever personnel file number you use. This is actually the last four digits of each individual's SSN. That's probably the easiest part of table one. So now we're gonna move on to the next column. And that next column in table one as reflected on the next slide is cash compensation. So a couple things to note about cash compensation. This is gonna be how much gross remuneration they received during the 56 day period. So here we're using the April 19th to June 13th date, right? The guidance makes clear 
this came out on Friday, that it can include hazard pay and bonuses. That's great news. We don't really know, because those terms are undefined, what Treasury and SBA considers eligible hazard pay and bonuses. So if I had a bonus paid uh, in the middle of my 56-day period that was scheduled to be paid, uh, before the start of my 56-day period, that certainly seems okay. But what about where I decide to pay a bonus to try to maximize my forgiveness amount? There we do not know. And so hopefully we'll re we will be receiving additional guidance on the definitions and concepts around hazard pay and bonuses. The other thing to keep in mind here is that the maximum amount that can be listed here and take coronavirus is 15385 That's a prorated amount of $100,000 of annual salary and wages. And that is because under the statute, the most money that can be taken into consideration for any one employee is capped at 100 k of annual comp. So no one can ever have in that cash comp column more than 15385 The other good news is that in addition to hazard pay and bonuses, it does appear to include severance and separation pay. Now, the one other thing I want to note here, and this goes back to the paid and incurred concept, is that cash comp that can get listed in, in this column not only picks up cash that was or cash that was earned and paid in that 56-day period, but it would also pick up uh, cash compensation that was earned prior to the 56-day period starting, but was paid sort of during that 56-day period. So take, for example, you know, our, our payroll began on April 19th. Well, there were services rendered maybe for that two-week period prior to April 19th. If those amounts are paid on April 19th or thereafter, they can get reflected in the cash comp number. Similarly, there's likely to be services rendered at the end of the 56-day period that get paid after the 56-day period ends. As long as they're paid in ordinary course, i.e., you know, during the next regular payroll cycle, those amounts can also get reflected. We then add up all those numbers. Uh, for Paul, Cora, and Fow, and we total them in box one at 29,475. Here's a simple example looking at Paul on the next slide. So let's say Paul was subject to a 30% reduction, but he was working on average now 28 hours per week over the course of that 56 day alternative covered payroll period, and he was paid on average $817.50. Um, you'd multiply that by eight and you'd end up with 6540. Now that number actually probably is um, low to the extent there was actually compensation earned prior to April 19th, but that was paid on or after April 19th. So that number actually might be a little bit higher, but if on the other hand, the ACH transaction happened, say, on um, uh, for that, uh, biweekly period on April 16th, those amounts would not be reflected because the ACH transaction would have happened before the start of that 56-day period. So it's all going to really turn on the facts and circumstances here. Okay, now we're going to move on to the next column, which is the average FTE. As we've talked about before, there are two ways your forgivable amount can be reduced. Well, there's more than two ways, but Two of the principal ways in which your FT, your forgiveness amount can be reduced is based on the headcount reduction factor and based on whether or not you reduce salary and hourly wages. This column is looking at whether you reduced headcount. And so what it's gonna be doing is it's gonna look at whether or not each of the employees during the 56 day period were working basically a full-time schedule. Because what you're trying to figure out for the enterprise is what the what their overall full-time equivalent headcount was on average for that 56-day period. And then we're going to be comparing that to a historical period of the sort of pre-pandemic headcount level to see whether you reduced headcount. 
The instructions and the regulations are helpful in that they answer a, a, a much asked question, which is, well, what is a full-time equivalent employee? And they said a full-time equivalent employee is an employee who was paid for 40 hours per week. And that is because, remember, you do not need to be working in order to be paid for purposes of that cash compensation number, right? The whole purpose of this program was in theory to put money in the pockets of workers who may not actually have been working. They may have been, you know, stuck at home under a stay at home order. So when you look at a full-time equivalent employee and you're looking at the average FTE score for each employee, you are gonna be focusing on how many hours per week on average they were paid for or they were working. An individual can only have an average FTE score of 1.0 or less. They cannot, so let's say you had Paul and Paul was working 60 hours a week. He would never have a FTE score of 1.5. It caps out at 1.0. Unfortunately, you sort of can't get credit for people who work a lot uh, beyond 40 hours. It's always gonna cap out at one. Um, the interesting thing here is that the instructions sort of talk about how you determine one's average FTE score for one week, but they don't then say, well, what happens after you figure that one week? Presumably, you're going to look at each average hours worked by week. You're then going to add up those eight weeks of average, and you're going to then average those eight weeks again. <laughs> Um, it's odd, but we don't actually have clarity on how that number is performed. But so we'll go to the next slide here, and hopefully this will provide some, some, some clarity. So remember, Paul is not working a full-time schedule. He's working a part-time schedule. But so we look at his average hours that he was paid uh, during the eight-week period of time. And so you'll see it for the week of 419, he worked 30 hours, 426, 28 hours. You add up all of those averages and you divide by eight and you get an average FTE score of 0.7. So because 28 hours is 70% of a full-time equivalent schedule of 40 hours, he has an average FTE result of 0 0.7. Doesn't matter what your definition is of part-time or full-time for purposes of the average FTE score, you are going off of the amount of hours paid or worked relative to uh, 40 hours per week. I apologize. I have window washers outside my window banging on the window. So I apologize for any background noise. So we take the 0 0.7 and we put it in the column next to Paul P. Phillips. We then go on to do the same thing for Cora and the same thing for FAO, and uh, we end up with the total, uh, the total uh, amount of the average FTE scores. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So you'll see here uh, at the bottom of the slide, they've also allowed for something called the simplified method. The simplified method is where basically for anyone who works less than a full-time equivalent schedule of 40 hours on average, you can just give them 0 0.5. So if you go to the next slide here, you'll see here, well, Paul worked 0.7 and Fao worked 0.3. Under the simplified method, Paul and Fao would just both get a 0 0.5. On average, you should sort of end up in the same spot. Um, on the other hand, if you have lots of employees who are working uh, during the, the pandemic at, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 hours, um, you should certainly think about whether the simplified method may result in a better uh, answer for you. So depending on which, depending on sort of the nature of your employment, you may end up with a higher average FTE score uh, for your enterprise using the simplified method than using the default method. The higher the score, the better because that's going to minimize the extent to which your forgivable amount is reduced. Okay, so you think like, you're like, great, I've got my average FTE score, I'm ready to go. Not so fast. If you look at the next slide here, we highlight a couple things for you. There is a row in table one. Interestingly, and, and, and I don't think anyone knows why, this row is not in table two. 
for purposes of table one, there's something called the FTE reduction exceptions. And this is something you're going to want to pay a lot of attention to because this is going to allow borrowers to add back in certain additional average FTE scores that will result in their average FTE overall score going up, which is going to help maximize their forgivable amount. And what it says is you can add back into table one FTE scores for, and you'll see there on number one, any positions for which the borrower made a good faith written offer to rehire an employee during the relevant period and uh, the offer was rejected. The regulations that came out on Friday add a host of bells and whistles. Um, the offer must be written. Uh, you need to document the rejection. Um, you'll need to notice the state UI department of the rejected offer. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen here, but the good news is, is that if you can meet the criteria, you can basically reflect that position as a 1.0 average FTE score if it was full time, even though the, the offer was rejected. Similarly, any employees who during the period were fired for cause, voluntarily resigned, or voluntarily requested that they have their hours reduced, those, uh, those folks can also be reflected in here in the exceptions. So we've got a couple examples on the next slide to sort of explain how this works. So going to the next slide here, let's start with example A. This is for any position for which the borrower made a good faith written offer and for which the offer was rejected by the employee. So in example A, ACME terminated Serology on April 1 prior to its receipt of the PPP loan, but they made a written offer to rehire Ciro for the same salary and hours. And this is one of the requirements of the good faith written offer uh, exception is that you made an offer to rehire them at the same pay and hours. Fortunately, Ciro declined because he was actually earning almost the same in UI benefits. ACME notified the state UI office of Ciro's refusal of the job offer, which is also a requirement under the exception. So as a result, ACME can reflect an additional average score of 1.0 for Ciro on its table one. You'll see there, there's an arrow and it shows 1.3. Well, we have one, we have to add back into 1.0 for Ciro, but we also got to add in a 0.3 for Paul P. Phillips. This is because Paul, a father, requested voluntarily to have his hours reduced from 40 hours per week to 28 hours per week to help care for his son whose daycare center had closed. Thus, ACME can reflect an additional average score of, of 0 0.3. This is because the hours were voluntarily reduced by 30% when compared against a 40 hour work week. So you'll see there we have a 1.3 in that box and that gets to be added to the other uh, scores in that column. All right, moving on now to the next slide. So before we look at the circle, the big red circle, let's look at box two. That shows our average FTE score with the reduction exceptions of 3.3. It's gonna be hugely important for us as we look at the headcount reduction calculation for the forgiveness application, uh, which really will be next week, but that 3.3 number is gonna be really important. So as I mentioned before, one other way your forgivable amount can be reduced is if you reduce salary, hour, salary or hourly wages relative to sort of the pre-pandemic levels. A few things to keep in mind here as reflected in those bullets. The first thing is, and actually I want to read the bullets in reverse. The great thing about the guidance that came out on Friday, perhaps one of the most helpful pieces, is that the guidance makes clear there is no double penalty. So obviously if you reduce someone's hours, that results in an average FTE score going down. But if you reduce their hours, they probably have their pay correspondingly reduced. And that results in a salary or hourly wage reduction. Well, what the guidance tells us is you don't have to reflect in the salary and hourly wage reduction any amounts that were attributable to 
reduction in hours that is reflected in the average FTE column. So remember Paul, when we reduced Paul's hours by 30%, it resulted in an average FTE score of 0 0.7. Well, his hourly wage or salary obviously went down too, but because it was attributable to his, his hour reduction, we get to put a zero in that column next to his name, which is good because it helps make sure we weren't doubly penalized. In terms of reflecting amounts in the bot, in the column, you're only including amounts in excess of a 25% reduction. So the reduction is less than 25%, you're gonna put a zero. We have an example there in that first bullet. If you had an employee who was making $1,000 a week and they had their pay reduced to $700, let's say it wasn't tied to reducing their hours, it was just a cost cutting measure. First 25% of the reduction is disregarded. So the first 250 is, is sort of a free pass. It's only the reduction in excess of 25% or $50 that would be shown in the salary hourly wage reduction column on table one. On the next slide, we have an example. All right, so let's take a look at Paul P. Phillips. As mentioned before, his pay was reduced by 30%. But even though his pay was reduced in excess of 25%, his, his reduction in pay was attributable solely to his change in hourly work. And therefore, under the no double penalty rule, his salary hourly wage reduction entry should be $0. Because every salary and hourly wage reduction was tied to having the reduction in his hours. Now, Fauci's scenario is a little bit more interesting. He was working 24 hours per week as an engineer. And as part of the company's cost cutting measures, his hours were also reduced, uh, just like Paul, but instead of 30%, it was 50% to 12 hours. This resulted in an average FTE score of 0.3. Fao's rate of pay was readily reduced as well by 50%. But as part of further cost cutting measures, his pay was reduced by another $150 per week. The 50% reduction in pay can be disregarded under the same no double penalty rule we just discussed. However, the additional $150 per week reduction was not attributable to a change in hours. It was just a cost cutting measure. Thus, it appears to us that this amount will need to be reflected in table one as the salary hourly wage reduction entry for Fauci, 150 times eight weeks. Um, the guidance is not comprehensive on sort of how to apply these concepts. So this again is how we are construing the guidance based on what we have before us. We certainly do hope we may see further information in the foreseeable future. We then take all of the salary hourly wage reduction entries for the employees in table one, we add them up and they end up at box three. And there you'll see we have $1,200 listed there for the total salary hourly wage reduction for box three. Okay, so we're pretty excited here. We are feeling pretty good about where we are, but there's more. So let's continue on. I appreciate everyone hanging in there. Hopefully uh, we're learning a lot. One thing you'll see here is that you can eliminate the salary hourly wage reduction. So remember we had a $1,200 salary hourly wage reduction for Fauci. If you can satisfy the salary hourly wage reduction safe harbor. So this is good news. This is another way for you to, to protect your forgivable amount. And what it basically says is, if under criteria one, basically the employee's annual pay was less than it was on February 15th, i.e. you reduced their pay, then you can actually show no salary hourly wage reduction if you're able to restore their pay to the same average annual salary hourly wage as of June 30th. This is one of these reasons why you may want to consider not racing for forgiveness if you're subject otherwise to a salary hourly wage reduction 
if you think you're going to be able to restore the wage levels for that employee by June 30th. The interesting thing is that the guidance suggests that you can restore that level perhaps before June 30th. What's not clear is whether you have to keep it restored from that moment in time through June 30th, for example, if you were to seek forgiveness before June 30th. So in light of the importance of this safe harbor, um, and in light of the fact you don't need to race in for forgiveness, there may be some pretty significant reasons to wait for clarifying guidance if this safe harbor could otherwise be helpful to you in maximizing your forgivable amount. Uh, now, if you could use the safe harbor, and let's say for FAO, we did increase his pay and restore his levels back by June 30th, um, then we would be able to go back and put a zero in that salary wage hour reduction column rather than list that $1,200 amount we previously talked about. All right, next slide. Oh, here's actually the example, which we just talked about. So um, we can actually move past uh, this slide as well. So I'm really excited to say we have passed table one. We are pretty excited. We've done actually most of the heavy lifting. When it comes to table two, remember the only folks who get listed here are employees who had annualized compensation of more than $100,000 in 2019. That was only Noah Swab. We list his four digits of his last SSN as his employee identifier. We calculate his cash compensation, uh, which was $9,230 during that 56 day period. Remember, uh, ACME was using the alternative payroll covered period. That began with its first payroll period after it got the loan. So that was April 19th through June 13th. But his hours during that period were cut in half. So he went from 40 hours a week to 20. And 20 is 50% of 40. So he shows an average FTE score of 0 0.5, which gets summed up in box five. As mentioned before, what's interesting here about table two, a couple things. One is there is no place to list an FTE reduction exception. So it doesn't appear that we can, we can sort of um, uh, add back in any FTE headcounts here. Uh, and it's not entirely clear the extent to which the safe harbor would apply to Noah Swab as well. Although we are optimistic that the same safe harbor we just walked through for table one would apply to Noah here on table two. The other thing we interestingly don't see is any place for a salary hourly wage reduction, which is actually a good thing. So while we don't have the FTE exception reductions, we don't seem to have a place where we need to worry about his compensation having been reduced. So one pro, one con, I guess in some ways it's uh, maybe perhaps it evens itself out. Uh, we do expect we may see further clarifying guidance on why the FTE reduction exception uh, is not listed here for table two, as well as uh, why we do not need to worry about salary hourly wage reduction factor with respect to table two employees. All righty, so we've completed table one and table two. We're really excited. You know why? Because we have completed part one of this three-part series. Um, as mentioned before, that is really where most of your effort uh, needs to be focused right now in terms of getting the base foundation for your loan forgiveness application. Next week, we're gonna continue on with our case study. We're gonna take the information we've just figured out, all the data, all the work we did, and we're gonna begin to complete Schedule A. And by the end of next week, you will have completed not only the worksheet, but the Schedule A as well. So I'm certainly hopeful that you'll join us next week for that session as well. But for now, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Jason and Andy for uh, any uh, follow-on comments.
Yes, thank you, Seth. Really, really fantastic details that you've been able to provide everybody with. Um, you know, again, this is a big part of what we do. The insight that you and Andy provide around this is integral to having a lot of people with these loans to go through this loan forgiveness process. So we're excited to have you continue on with us um, and go through this process to really help. And what I can say is for you know everyone on this call, Utilize us, you know, utilize prestige and the expertise that we come along with to help you go through this process. You know, we really um, want to provide you with as much support as possible, and that's what we're here for. So definitely reach out to your support system. Today's presentation will be posted in our COVID Resource Center within our Prestige website. You can see the link right there, up there on the screen in front of you. Um, and we will continue to deploy our COVID email updates later in the week as we normally do. Please stay tuned for the invitation for next week's webinar, which will come out in the upcoming days. It will give you a description of what's going to be discussed during that webinar, but as you can guess from what Seth said, we will be continuing along with this process and giving everyone the support that they need to go through this loan forgiveness application process. So again, thank you for spending some time with us here this morning. We do appreciate you setting aside the time and we hope you have a fantastic day and the rest of the week.